Time and again, our Lord was frustrated with the dullness of the hearing of the people. You can see that in the way he, he came out with phrases like, I have many things to say to you, yet you're unable to bear them. Some of the things that he found they were unwilling to hear, he eventually had to just say it. For the little group of disciples around him, there was no room in their philosophy for a, a dying Jesus. What they had learned from the rabbis and the rabbinical texts. No, all their teaching concerning the coming of the Messiah was the coming of a great militaristic conqueror, a white steed, a sword. When you study the intertestamental period between the Old and New Testament, about 400 years, there are some heroic stories that are emerged in those centuries that have to do with the Maccabees and those Jews that hung on to their heritage and nationality and national entity and fought for it. Some tremendous stories. A lot of Protestants don't read them. They should. Now, all of that grew out of the fact that Israel had a distorted understanding of its destiny in world history and history in general. It was a political destiny. It was a materialistic destiny. And when Messiah came, Messiah was going to lead them into a, his great political, economical superiority that they felt was there by you know, their effective calling. And then came Jesus. He wasn't born in a palace, he was born in a manger, as we'll be celebrating, you know, in December. He wasn't born in fanfare. There were no purple robes and no silver trumpets and no courtiers and gold crowns paying homage to an infant, infant prince that was born in this world. He was born to a very humble artisan and a little peasant girl by the name of Mary. And the general populace, they don't know anything about him. God had come in to the human scene virtually unannounced. Uh, that was for a reason. <laughs> he knew men. Now, as he grew up, he was a normal Jewish boy, I believe. A little pop, maybe. Made his first trip to Jerusalem, as many Jewish boys do, at the age of 12. His eyes were aglow and august and have got large with excitement as he came over one of many of the Judean hills and saw that famous ancient and holy city of Jerusalem, the gorgeous temple. Everything was exciting to him. He heard about it. It was in the National Center. It was the city. Then the temple, of course, again, the heart of the city was the temple. That's so exciting. He got into all of its involvements, and when his parents were going home in the caravan, and they were traveling with all the relatives, and they thought Jesus was with the, some of the cousins, some of the relatives. And about along the way, a couple of days, Mary said to Joseph, have you seen Jesus? Joseph, have you seen Jesus? Joseph said, no, I haven't seen him. He's probably over with some of the relatives and family. Could we go find out? They went hunting for him, and he wasn't in the group. So they had to go all the way back two days. He found he never left Jerusalem. He was sitting with the, having a discussion with the rabbis in the temple. Twelve-year-old boy. He was asking them precocious questions, interesting questions, deep ones. And they, they were amazed at his wisdom. I don't think Jesus was being disrespectful. And he wasn't being cocky. Not him. I don't think he was. I don't think he was showing off. I'm smarter than you. No, I think out of his perfect humanity, because I know him, he was asking pure questions to these rabbis. You read the word. Now, they were used to intellectual jockeying around and questions back and forth, but Jesus didn't ask that. He, he, he was fearful and straightforward about it, I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> he took him back home there, Joseph did. 
And you don't hear any more about him for all these long years. One single simple story. It tells us about him and his trip to Jerusalem. That's it. That's all you get. And all of a sudden he appears on the banks of the Jordan, where his cousin John the Baptist is baptizing out there, conducting the most unusual meetings. And God is only in those meetings. People are pouring out of Judean, Judean Christian towns and flooding to the Jordan. From everywhere they came to him. They stand on the banks of the Jordan when this strange prophet. He's knee deep in water, and he's proclaiming his strange, impacting message, impent from the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now he baptized for the remission of your sins and bring forth fruit, need for repentance, need for repentance. Now as he's doing this one day, they walk down the, the Jordan towards him, a young man, uh, only six months, is younger than himself, and didn't recognize him. And then, and I always thought that was strange, but he went out in the woods. As he steps down in the water to be baptized, John, he recognized Jesus. He knows who he is. He said, I can't baptize you. Jesus said, baptize me. It needs to be. It must fulfill all righteousness. You know, when he came up out of the water, a dove hovered over his head, came down on him. A voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. Now, from there, he was driven into the wilderness for his temptation. And he had to go through what the first Adam went through. He had to be tempted. And he was tempted. And he came through the temptation and came back in the power of the Spirit. And he headed for the synagogue in the hometown of Nazareth. As he sat in the synagogue that morning, he'd been there many times. He went, he went to church with his mom and daddy. It must have been very difficult for them to listen to Jesus. Is one of them. Can you imagine that? What impact that would have of, of uh, Frank or John, who'd been in your congregation forever, and all of a sudden he stands up after he'd been going there since he was little, <clears throat> and comes forward and he says, He's reading scriptures, and he's asking me to ask him if he could read scripture. Sure. It's your turn now. So he turns to passage in Isaiah and starts to read. The Spirit of God is upon me, for he has anointed me to read the gospel, preach, preach the gospel to the poor. Everybody in that synagogue knew that messianic psalm. And here's John reading that psalm. There's nothing wrong with reading it. But as he gets, John gets to the end of it. He says, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. I'm the one the scripture's talking about. And John? What? He's a little boy coming here. He's been coming for years. Now, that's pretty extreme, but still, that's the 30-year-old man who, with his mother Mary, had been attending that synagogue. And on that particular morning, he takes his right as a young man to read the scripture in the synagogue. He wants to share. And he starts to read that scripture. And to this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Now, you know they took offense right away. This is Jesus, this is Mary's boy. They tried to get rid of him, and he slipped out of, out of the grasp. And, and that's pretty hard to do. And somehow he came through it, huh? And they didn't throw him off the hill on the cliff. <clears throat> As he begins to unfold God's truth, he got the same kind of response again and again and again. I couldn't believe that this man could say these kinds of things that they had to listen to, or that they had to agree with, one or the other. So he had a problem, not only with his own friends and his own home synagogue, but as he gathered his disciples together and gathered them around him, they weren't too sure who he was either. They were attracted to him. There was something about him that led, him in, led them into him, but they weren't, they weren't sure who he was. He was attractive, but they weren't sure. Now, they were excited at his miracles and listened to things he said, and they shook their heads at it and said to one another, Do you know what he said? What do you mean by that? I discuss these things all the time. And he's still having trouble with them. How long am I going to be with you? And then came that moment when he gave his his great altar call. <laughs> big altar call. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. I have nothing to do with you. And the crowd dispersed. That's it. It's gone. Now we're going to eat his flesh and drink his blood. We're gone. And they left. And turned to a 12 disciples and said, well, What about you? You going with the rest of them? 
And their answer was, 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 and it isn't totally heartening. Now, if you're a leader, their answer would get you, wouldn't get encouraged by what they said. Well, we're going to go. You're it. If there's any other, out we go. But there's no out here. There we go. You've got something that's got us hooked here. I don't know what it is, but you alone had the words of eternal life. We know that. But uh, your message sometimes. We'll stay, we'll stay. Now, I know that's exciting for him, huh? Is it exciting for you when things like that happen to you? But not quite to that degree. They stayed, but they were never, never convinced by what he said. They just weren't. They were waiting for the moment, if he was the Messiah, when he suddenly he would take off his mantle of humility that he wore, and throw that robe down, and put on a coat of armor, and uh, say some magic word, and suddenly the, there would be 13 white horses there for them, and armor, and swords, and they were ready for massive war, and they'd climb aboard those horses, and they would take off. And first of all, probably, probably take off the governorship of Palestine right there, First, that first thing. And head on to Rome and finish them off. But yet their leader continued to be humble and meek, mild. When the pressures began to come on him from the Pharisees and Sadducees, he didn't fight back with sword. He didn't. He dealt with them with words, and even the words were. But he wasn't what they envisioned, and they kept hoping that he would change. His role, read it, you'll see that. Somehow he needs to change. And one day he really shocked them. He'd been wanting to tell them the truth, but they'd been getting up close to it, but uh, not quite. He was going to try to break into the dullness. Now one day he couldn't wait any longer. The Bible simply says this. From that time forward, Jesus began to tell him how he needs to go to Jerusalem and suffer at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees and and be crucified and rise again on the third day. And that was all they could deal with there. That's all they could handle. The Bible said that Peter whirled around with Jesus and he said, This shall not be unto thee, Lord. And Jesus equally turned around to him and turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For thou savest the things be of man, not of God. Man made things. <laughs> and for eight days, you can imagine the tension that was in that group. Oh, oh. As they walked the rows of the ancient, ancient east there. <laughs> and Peter was probably pouting. Slick was stepping out. He was mad. And he said to the other ones, he, he called me a devil. He called me Satan, the devil. He did. The Bible simply, very, very simply said, and eight days later, he taketh Peter, James, and John, and goeth up to a mountain. And he stretched figure before them all, right there. And suddenly they see him in all his glory. Like they'd never seen him before. And Peter makes another one of his foot statements to each speeches. He said, let's build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Let's permatize this. This is why we're here. This is, we've never seen him like this before. He's white as snow, glorified. We've seen him heal the sick, and raise the dead, feed, feed people. But we never saw this before. We've never seen this before. This is why he came. we got to make this, crystallize this thing, make it permanent. The Bible said that. A cloud of glory to set him down over Peter, and a voice from heaven said, This Hallelujah. This is my son. Listen to him. Don't listen to Peter. Listen to him. The cloud was God's gentle way of saying, Peter, hush up. This is not the end of the matter, Peter. This is the beginning of the end, but it's not the end. Now I say all that to say this. That Jesus didn't have the greatest cooperation at all, right from the beginning, who from people who heard him, he didn't have cooperation. Now he's come to the end of the deal. His disciples don't understand him. The crowd doesn't understand him at all. He can't even get a crowd hardly anymore. Look at it. He's talking about success in the ministry. Boy, he was successful, huh? Jesus started out with a flourish the first year of his ministry. The fame spread everywhere by the third year of his ministry. Three years. His whole ministry was declining fast. The number of miracles declined. Instead of feeding 5,000, he fed 4,000. He's now hiding for his life, regular. He's about to be crucified. 
this is not in the script, right, that the rabbis had written. It's not what he's supposed to do. He's not the one. When the time comes, he's got to go through with this, whether his disciples understand it or not. He doesn't care. He's got to do what he's got to do. So he calls him one day, and he says, I want you to go and get a room. And he gave Mama the things that were necessary, signs for the getting of the room. And they got a room, and they prepared it. And I said, I'm going to celebrate the last Passover there with you. The last one. And as they gathered together for Passover, it started out bad too. <laughs> kind of rough. Because when the disciples came together, they got the room all ready. And as you get a room ready in those days, you one of the first things you have is right at the door, you have a large container of water with a basin in it and the slave's towel there as so well that you put around his middle, whoever you are, to wipe the feet of the guests to come in after you washed them in the basin. So they got the great water container and they got the basin. They got the towel and everything was ready. Everything was ready to go. And there was a the table, the, the couch was all the size and it was all ready. Getting ready for the celebration of the Passover. It was exciting. And as the disciples filed in, one by one, out of the corner of their eye, they saw the water. Now, think about it. Normally, at a man's home, where he's able to afford a servant, there would be a servant there who would uh, stop to each guest and remove his sandals and wash his feet. That was a custom of, of courtesy of the time. In the East. Now, there was no servant. There wasn't anybody up there. And that had been an issue with the disciples because they figured Jesus was going to become a great king and they wanted to be the top dogs in the great kingdom. And uh, they were fussing all the time, all the time, which one's the greatest, which one's the greatest. All the time they were talking to each other. Now the issue is this. Well, as we're sitting there staring at us, and each one of, as each one of them comes in for the last Passover, it's the last meal in which the master had said that, the last one. Now, each of them out of the corner of his eyes sees the basin. But, of course, he says, I shouldn't be the one to wash my companion's feet. Each one of them said that, not me. I'm not. No. I'm top dog. I have a claim of, as the greatest of disciples. We've all done things. So one by one, they walked in and they took their place at the table with their feet caked with muck and dirt and contamination of the road, the earth, the things here they touched. And Jesus came in and took the whole picture in at a glance, looked at it all. He just saw the rows of dirty feet. That's not how we do things. He saw the unused water basin. He saw the yet dry towel. He realized that after three and a half years, after three and a half years with them, laboring with these men, he still had not made any kind of impression with them that he needed to, that he wanted to. They were still caught up with a false idea about what he was supposed to do. A false idea about themselves and about the world and Jerusalem. He said nothing about it. He went and sat down. Everybody had his shoes on. <laughs> now, as the evening progressed, the Bible says this. He rose up. And he took off his outer garment, which would leave him in an undergarment, which was the way the slaves served, in his undergarment. And he laid, his gar laid aside his garment and he went over to the water. He, now you can imagine what's going on with them. They're washing. Oh, they're embarrassed now. They're chagrined and they're angry too. Peter looks at John and says, John, why did you attend to the bush washing, John? John said, why should I do it? Why don't you do it? You should attend to it yourself. Who do you think you are telling me to do it? Ah. Andrew, why don't you do it? Why should I do it? I'm as good as you are. We all. And they keep saying that it raises the whole question about whether we do things because we are good as each other or we do them as we're motivated by a love for each other that doesn't stand on being better than others. Am I better than you? Am I too good to wash your feet? Am I too good to help you in your trials and temptation? Things are happening. Am I get dirty? Is there a brotherhood spirit among us at all? But how? Now, who knows what emotions are going through them? What their hearts are saying to each other? Now, Jesus rises up and 
<laughs> it takes up the towel. And it's just too late now, they all said to themselves. Too late. He goes over and wraps, takes that towel, wraps it around his waist. Son of God, the creator of all things in the universe. Everything. These creatures with dirty feet, he's staring at them. Oh, boys. He pours the water in the basin. Yeah. That head's right for Peter, doesn't he? <laughs> and Peter is horrified about this. Oh, no. Yeah, that's right, Peter. Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet, are you? No, you're not. Jesus smiled at him and said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. He didn't say anything. He said, with me and in me, it's different. In me is union. With me is communion. 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 And Peter said, all right, if you're going to wash my feet, wash my all over. Jesus said, don't, don't mess it up, Peter. Don't spoil this. Just do it. Just listen. You're already clean. It's just your feet are dirty. What's he saying? Now, he's saying this. You and I, this morning, we've been cleansed by the blood of Christ and washed with the word. And we're Christians. But are any of us sitting here with dirty feet? Are you sitting there with dirty feet? Think about it. Now, what's dirty feet stand for? You're a Christian, and you've got dirty feet. Well, you've walked in situations and accumulated contamination of this world needs to be washed off you from your walk. Wash those feet. The labor, brazen labor, feet and hands. So Jesus washed the feet. And as he was finishing, he said this. You're not clear on what I'm doing this, but you will understand it. And then he said this. Later on, what I'm doing to you, you'll do to one another. And let me say, we're not just talking about a foot washing party. We're talking about something else. Now, I wanted to talk to you this morning about cleansing. I did. It's, but I, I, there's a sense that, and this is where it's very difficult if we're not good people. There is a sense in which we're responsible to keep each other clean. We are. I have been chewed out for this. Are you listening to me? There is a sense when we owe it to each other, when we see somebody getting their feet dirty and going to dirty places all the time, and uh, I'm just going to say it like this, John, brother, that's not the best for you. Don't do this. Now, I, I, I'm running a big risk here talking to John. John's not only my brother, he may be my friend too, but John could say, why don't you shut up, mind your business, or he could say to me, thank you. Thank you, Mike. I have to run that risk. That's why love was very vulnerable. You ever gone to somebody and said, I think you're making a mistake. I have. That's been half of my ministry was going to young people say, making a mistake, don't do this. And it wasn't a little thing. I've come away with people yelling at me, come away with saying, you and Jesus stay out of my business. Oh, I was no you and Jesus. I've had people say, you, you are in cahoots with Jesus like he knows everything he tells you. Now, how we react to that is a measure of our goodness. And after 20 years, I didn't act too good about it. I was kind of mad that people were stupid. So I quit to a point for a while. And Jesus said, you have to love and we confront one another. Another. And Jesus said, there will come a time when you can confront one another and wash one another's feet. Well, that was few and far between. So if they do it to Jesus, they do it to me. And I said all that to set the stage for this. What Jesus said in John 14. John 14. Disciples are confused. They, they don't know what's going on. They don't. They think something, but they don't know the whole thing. They don't know. Jesus hadn't turned out the way they thought he would at all. And somehow, he's not able to change their minds at all. He's, they tried, to, And that's interesting to think of. After all that, it's possible that you and I can be so self-willed and Hard that even Jesus can't change our mind, couldn't change their mind, he was standing there with them. I suggest it might be. Yeah. Now, that being so, how much danger are you and I walking in? I, really, really? When we refuse to hear the Word of God from the Bible, out of people, out of man. The Bible calls it forsaking your own mercies. There are thousands and thousands of people out there t today. On the lip of destruction because they forsook their own mercy. They didn't listen and didn't put it up against themselves. 
you and I very simply this morning, as I'm teaching this, we're standing in this relationship. Here am I with my will, and there is he with his will. His will is better than mine. But if I insist that my will shall be done on earth, well, rather than his, guess what? Anyway, all right, free will. Now I set my feet on the path of destruction is what I've done. And you see it? People see it? So it starts out with a beautiful saying that says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe so in me. That's 14.1. When I was a little boy with my mom and grandma, to a church that we attended, with grandma mostly, and every Sunday morning, they had a, a kind of a testimony time, kind of, mostly. I was Roman Catholic, but I'd listen to people, watch people, and uh, I'd watch people talk about the Lord. They didn't talk about it much because there wasn't much in there. But I'd hear this, let not your heart be troubled, believe in God. Believe also in me. There are many mansions in heaven. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't tell you. I'd go prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again. i receive you again unto myself. Now, when I was a boy, I had that memorized. Because it's just been beat into me. I, uh, and all the Catholicism stuff, I didn't take so good. And I finally quit it because I did Jesus. I, they wanted me to be a priest, and I didn't want to be. I didn't want to get married and have kids. And, and feel, I felt the call of God on my life, but no, not that way. I didn't want to do it. You know, let not your heart be troubled. Trust me, he said. Trust me. You trust me, Mike. I want to give you the truth, but but you're too emotionally distraught. But trust me. I want to tell you something. Now, one of the translations very beautiful says this, says this. Let not your heart be rippled. Like the ripples of a sea. And the picture is this of a vast, beautiful lake. And it's a clear summer day. It's beautiful. A lot of breath of wind and the whole thing. I remember years ago when I went and took my first boat in, in the Coast Guard. And our first runs when I got there, then I hadn't been on a big boat out in the ocean at all. We were a rescue boat, a drug boat, and, you know, did our thing. But I got on there, the water was becalmed. It was flat as flat, all the way out. We were 30, 40 miles off the island, so we were going. And I said, this is something else. There's just a little rock in the boat as we were traveling out there. But there wasn't a breeze. There wasn't anything. That water was just clean and clear and crisp. And as we got out there to the islands, there were just rocks sticking out of the blue and going up into the blue. And I took pictures of this. I took pictures of everything. They gave me the waters and the islands. Together, when I got it developed, I could turn it either way. And it looked like it was just perfect. That islands were silhouetted in the water, and the water was so completely free of ripples of any sort, it was like a mirror. And the trees were perfect. Their trees and the islands were perfectly mirrored in the waters. And every time I read this, I think of that. Don't let your heart be rippled. Let not your heart be rippled. Now, is it possibly for, for me to so trust in God that no matter what's going on, I know my blood pressure doesn't fly off, fear doesn't come upon me, and it's all kinds of strange feelings. Now, that's called letting the peace of God reign in your heart. And I believe that takes a little practice. There's three kinds of peace. Peace with God, peace of God, and peace on earth. Peace with God is legal peace. That you have by faith in Jesus Christ and his blood, you have peace with God. There's no fight between you and God anymore. But many of us have peace with God, but we don't have peace of God. How many here listening to this know you're saved? You know you're a Christian. Now, how many of you have trouble... Uh, sometimes you have trouble believing God, sometimes. And people voted there, huh? All raise your hand. Well, what does that mean? That means you lost your salvation? No, it doesn't. It means that you've lost your spiritual composure. You, you lose it. Your spiritual composure, don't believe it. Now, Bishop Taylor Smith, uh, uh, old, ba he's old bishop, <laughs> Baptist bishop, Constantly, they love children. They, they hound him for attention. They stick their autograph albums in front of him. Yeah, Bishop. And he used to put this verse inside of it. Uniform in every one of them. Every one of them. The Bishop did. It's kind of strange, but he did. Emphasis, emphasis on Bishop. When you hear it, you'll go, well, that's not the kind of a verse that Bishop will put in an autograph book of a child. Now, he did. And this is the verse. The word cow would have lived till now 
if she hadn't lost her breath. But she thought her hay wouldn't last all day, so she moved herself to death. <laughs> oh, that's a saying, huh? Now, as first glance, you say, that's not a very bishop-like verse, is it? But take a good look at it. It's a very good bishop verse. It's a good Bible-like verse. A lesson to be had. The word cow would have lived till now if she hadn't lost her breath. But she thought her hay wouldn't last all day. Right there. There it is. God loves you, but you're not sure he can keep your hay supply going. <laughs> so you moo and die. Let not your heart be rippled. Don't let it be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now listen, very quickly, I'm going to recite to you seven I wills from this 14th chapter of John, where Jesus says what he'll do, what he'll do for the untroubled heart. What he'll do. What he'll do for the responsive heart. He said, uh, I go and prepare a place for you, number one, in verse three. If I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's a big one right there. I'll come again and receive you to myself. Now, those same disciples, in a few moments, are going to do all kinds of things. They're going to come undone. Judas is going to betray him and go into the night and hang himself. Peter is going to betray him and say, I never knew you. And go out and weep bitterly for that. Didn't hang himself, but he weeped bitterly. The disciples are going to scatter. Run. They're going to run and hide everywhere they can run. Hide behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. This is the crowd that he's saying till now, let not your heart be troubled. Oh. Now, there's going to be consternation. Never going to sin again. Never. Never. And most of them, if not all of them, without exception, believe that when they took him down off the cross, that was the end of it. When it was all over. I took him off that cross. He was dead. And the two of the disciples are going home to Emmaus and they're walking along the road and, and they're commiserating with each other about the death and how horrible things were and then suddenly a stranger catches up to him walks alongside of him and as he sees the distress and consternation in their faces and hears the talk he he says well, what are you boys talking about what's the problem why come you're talking like this you seem to be upset about something they give him a glance over and don't recognize him at all. He's just another intruding stranger came in there and started talking to him. Sir, you must be new around here. You haven't heard about what happened? We're followers of one uh, Jesus. We had hoped that he would have been the one that would have had the white horse and marched on Herod and taken over everything, taken over Rome. But he died on the cross. And it's all over now. And now we're going home. It's a done deal. And this stranger said to him, said strange things to them. But he said, he looked at those two and they looked back at him. And they were distraught. And they didn't recognize him. I think that's funny. And this stranger said, hey, fools and slow of heart. Boy, still, to believe all the prophets have said. And starting with Moses, the prophets, they began to expound to them the scriptures concerning himself. And they're walking along listening to him. And they still don't hear him too good. They'd heard that before in different ways. But they don't steer the stranger. And now they come to Animus, Animus a little village. And, and here's a cottage. And they go to turn in. And the Bible said he made as though as that he'd go on. He always, he always makes it look, look like that he's going to go on. He always does. If you're not careful, he will go on. You better call him. You may miss him. That's another teaching. Because you're all taken up with your own things and sorrows and pains and things that are hitting you. Circumstances. But their Eastern hospitality revived a little bit. And they turned and said, excuse us, stranger. We're so upset with our loss that we didn't think about you. Come in and break bread with us here on the road. He said, thank you. And they still don't recognize him. And they go in. And how long was there? I don't know. 
but then really sit down and break bread and you're thinking about this. He takes the lead on this and starts talking. He reaches out and to take the bread. Now, could it be that he reached out? Well, maybe they saw him. They saw something that familiar. In any case, it's something. He took the bread and he blessed it. He broke it. As he was about to give it, they recognized it. He said this, Rabboni. Oh, boop, he was gone. Oh, my God. Imagine that. Now, had they had believed what he had said in the beginning, the months before he had said the same thing to them, are you listening to me, all of you? Because, and Jesus is saying this, can you listen to me? The Lord had said things to you and me too, months ago. We didn't hear it. Something in us, and we didn't hear it. Months before he said to them, now look, children, I must needs be go down to Jerusalem and suffer at the hands of the scribes and the Pharisees and be crucified. They're going to kill me. And I'll rise again on the third day. They never heard him say, rise again the third day. He got the killed part and it stopped right there. <laughs> he, he can't die. If, if, he can, if he dies, he can't do for us what he's supposed to do. He can't die. That's part of the deal. Now, I don't think you should tell God what he can't do and can do. It won't serve you well. It just won't do you well. They never heard him say resurrection. In fact, when the women went to the tomb and the body was gone, they came back to the disciples and said, body's gone. Somebody stole it. Somebody, somebody took the body. The body's gone. And Mary brushed in and she said, I saw the master. You didn't see him. You're crazy. Women always imagine themselves and doing things. The Bible simply says this. They did not believe the women. But simply, they didn't believe them. They didn't believe them. But I don't know how long they sit there, disgusted and mad at the crazy women. But suddenly, something happened. Peter said, John, I remember that day when he called me the devil? I remember that stuck in my mind. He called me the devil. Do you remember him saying this? That he told us about dying and got upset about him. I guess he said it made me mad. Didn't he say he was going to rise again? Is that what he said? John said, to come to think of it, Peter. Peter, I think you're right. And they headed for the sepulcher and, and he's gone. He's not in there. Now, John got there first because he's faster afoot. Little slimmer than Peter. But he had Peter's impulsive. John got and looked in. John looked in. Peter, he'd come running up there and he went right past John and went on in. Let's go into this deal, find out what's going on. John, you gotta come see what's going on, John. Come in here. The grave clothes are all still there. With the napkins all folded up and over his face. It's all folded. He came out of it. He's just gone. He's not rippled up. Put things away. He came out of it. Now, what am I saying to you? All of you, listen to me. It's kind of a hard one, but but if you and I, you and I, you look after yourself, I, I, I. If I could only believe his word, I'd save myself a whole lot of grief and torture and upsetness and tossing and turning and upset stomach and uncertainty. On the verge of an ulcer if I just believe his word. How do you do it? How do you do this? Huh. What are we doing, all of us? I used to listen to so many teachers, but there were three people that these Bible teachers didn't have much time for. They didn't have much time for holy rollers, didn't roll. <laughs> Two kids, they, they didn't have much time for Methodists that had no method. I know a few Methodists were bad. The third one was the punchline, or their punchline. He didn't have much time for believers that didn't believe. Well, that's, that's been the big one for me. They didn't believe him. 
Now, I was listening to this professor who he was probably, we profess to be believers. Are you a believer? Oh, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. So he asked me, what do you believe? I believe Jesus died for my sins. Good. That's good. Now, I don't, I don't believe that part, but I believe this, but I don't believe that. Now, our belief is confined to our measure of faith and how far it takes us. And many times, that's how I'll pray for people. How far can you believe? I'll agree with you at that area. That's for two to touch anything. And he said, let your not, let not your heart be ripples. So that's true. I'm going to go on a diet and confuse all your philosophy and mess with it. And I'm going to be buried. You're going to think it's all over. But if you could only trust me, trust me for the next few days. Just trust me in what I said. Let not your heart be troubled. Trust me. Don't let it be ribald. Believe me. You work it out. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, but believe also in me. In my Father's house are many resting places. The angels rest, and the archangels rest. There's all kinds of resting places there. And I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, a special place of redemption for you, where you can enter in. And then you rest, and I'll come back and get you. And I'll tell you about it so you can be where I am. That's what he said. I'm not talking down to you. It can be a hard time for certain things, too. Now, listen. I will come back. That's what he said. I will come back. I will come back. Now, if you saw him hanging on the cross, Isaiah said, he didn't even look like a man anymore. He was mutilated. His body was out of joints. His, his swollen tongue was protruding out of his mouth, suffering. Purple congenial blood, and sweaty blood of Gethsemane still gelled up on him with dirt and dust in it. Just receiving the new blood from the crown of thorns was grotesque, it looked rough. I'll come back, he said. You, you're going to come back from that? It's what they saw. The dead. The soldiers came, they're going to break his legs and let him suffocate. The Sabbath evening, they can't leave him there all night. Can't leave him on the cross. They're going to break his legs and That'll suffocate. He did. He just pulled down. He's already dead. Stuck him with a spear, too. I shoved that spear to his side, and blood and water came out. Huh. I'll return to you, he said. From that picture? Yeah, I will. Trust me. Now Joseph was taken down off the cross and washed him up and preparing for burial, laying him up. He said, let you not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house. I already, I already told you, I'll prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again. Well, he said that, didn't he? Yeah. He's going to come again. Now they're putting him in Joseph's tomb. Joseph of Arimathea. Now what are those Roman soldiers doing? They're rolling a big stone in front of it. Oh. But he said he'd come again. But everything we see is... It'd be pretty tough. And did he come again? Yep, he did. Of course he did. He did. To, he came to him on the MS road. He rocked, walked right through the door being shut and talked to them in the rooms. He came again, ate fish with him. It's his word versus circumstances and what you see in the five fold, five senses that you have that lie to you. Now, if you can receive the fact that he did what he said he was going to do, all the other I wills, uh, they're going to fall right in the same category. I wills, I loves. I will come again. And he came again. He rose from the dead. They rolled the stone away. He came forth out of there. He's risen. He broke the power of death. Destroyed it. Nobody's ever done that before. He broke it. And they would touch him again. Now the first I will came to pass. Came to, it came to pass, the first one. Now here's the others. Very quickly, I'll give them to you in order. He's saying all these things. Everything he said to them. They're sitting around the room. Remember that? He's got ahead and give you some of the events that subsequent to that. But still, we're back in that room at 14. Jesus sitting very intimately with them and sitting down talking. He's talking to them and telling them what he's going to do. If I go, I'll come again. I'll receive you unto myself. Because where I am, there she, you're going to be there too. Don't worry about it. And he continues to talk to him about it. Now look at the second one. I will. In verse 13. 
and whatsoever you have asked in my, my name, that will I do, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. Ask you anything in my name, I will do it. Ask anything in my name, and I'll do it. Now that's your second I will. First I will was, I'll come back from the dead for you. I'll receive you into myself in redemption and salvation. Now, let me ask you a question here. Are you ready for this one? Did he come back? Yes or no? Well, if that I will went right, what about the rest of I wills? He did that one. Did he do these? What's the second one then? Whatsoever you ask in my name, I'll do it. Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. Let's say it all together now. I will do it. That's what the Lord said. Now you say it, I'll do it. Just believe his word, I'll do it. He did the first one, he did this one too. Now let's go to the third one. The third one's like the first one. Verse 16 says this, I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper, that he'll be with you forever. And that spirit of truth, and the world can't receive him, but I'm going to pray the Father, and he'll, he'll send the comforter to you. Now did the comforter come? Was there a day of Pentecost? Yes, there was. Have you received the Comforter? And I will. It came to pass. It's here, didn't it? Well, that's good. So far, we've got two out of three that we actually have historical proof of. Now, if he came back in resurrection, if he sent the Comforter to you, that's two historical, experiential Proofs that he, I will, that are valid and start to come to pass. Now, sandwiched in between is this other one. And so, whether you ask in my name, I'll do it. You now, one of the chances of that being right, ask anything in his name, he'll do it. I'm probably pretty good so far. I'm on the records there. Huh. Hmm. I think about it. Now, we're in a bit of a jam right now, aren't we? I'm thinking about it. And you say, I don't know. Those, those other two are, uh, they're right on the money, but that in between, I'll do anything you ask. Now, after years of experience, I can tell you why we're not too sure about that. It's found over in the Beck of James, way over there. James, you have not, because you ask not. You have not. Say it together. Have you not because you ask not? We have not because we ask not? Now, that's a, a wonderful thing. Well, things in prayer about not asking. Now, Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that. The comforter came, and I believe that. But the prayer thing, now, that's something else. It's hard to believe. It's, a, it's an I will in the same category as the other ones. So you better believe it. Number four, verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless. I'll come to you. Now, this is a big one right here. A whole area of whoop de doo I don't have time to go into that, but how many of us have very naively, simplistically, for many years, believe that whenever the New Testament speaks of the coming of the Lord, it's referred to the second coming. A lot of people believe that. A lot of Christians do. How many of us know that there are many comings of the Lord in the New Testament? Lots of them. He said, when the Spirit has come, that's, that's me coming. I'll come to you when the Spirit comes to you. That's me. I'll come to you. The coming of the Holy Spirit is the coming of Christ. Now, it's not the second coming, but it's a coming. I'll give you another one from the book of Revelation. In the seven letters of the seven churches, you listen to this. Except you repent, I will come unto you and remove your candlestick. I will come. And that's a coming too. Instead of a rough one, but it's a coming. There's all kinds of coming. There's one Greek word about this. El kum, I believe. I'm not good at Greek. But it's different than the other words of the coming. Parousia, epiphania, apocalypsis. This is a different word. And it means that ever since he left, he's been coming. Ever since he left, he's been coming. 
He's been, been possessively coming down through the centuries. He visits here all the time. Now, there's sometimes he comes to you especially in judgment and blessing. But he comes. Now, that's a coming. Now, on the day of Pentecost, he, he came. Well, that's number four. Number five. He came. Now, number five. Verse 21. Now, listen. This is where it starts to get important now. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. He loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him. And I'll disclose myself to him. Number five is, I love him. Don't you love us all, Lord? Yes, he loves you all. Of course he does. But what do you mean by that one? Well, I'm able to express my love and love specifically those who keep my commandments. Huh. There is a special love that's for those who walk in obedience. Do what he says. Keep his commandments. Huh. And that's not just written ones. That's things that you start learning about him and know the little nuances. Because it costs, it costs a lot. It costs everything to walk in obedience to Jesus. Very costly. Families, friends, sons, daughters. Oh, they'll, they'll walk off. <laughs> Augustine's toughy. Augustine. And after he's converted with the roughs and toughs, the roughs and toughs came to visit Augustine. And as he saw him coming, he started running down the road. And he said, Augustine, Augustine, where are, you, where are your friends? Where are you going? And over his shoulder, as he kept on running, he said, this is not Augustine. Augustine's dead. This, this, I'm dead. I did that with my friends. That fellow you used to love is gone. He's dead. He was saying this. What was he saying? You were my friends. But I died to your kind of friendship. You're not friends no more. That boy's dead. And I had to do that with many people. Now, turning from that kind of thing and running down the road, it looks like Augustine's very much alone. But what's he doing? He's running pell-mell into the arms of the Lord. He's running full blast into the arms of the Lord, as quick as he can get there. You think about that now. It's a special love. He that keeps my commandments, I love him. No. Every one of us, if we're Christians this morning, listen to me, would love a special manifestation of the love of God, wouldn't we, of the Lord? How many would like the Lord to appear to you? You would just to have the Lord appear to you. That's costly too. Because when he appears to you, the other things see that too. And they go, oh, he that has my commandments and keepeth them. Well, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved by my father. And I love him. That's five. There's six. And we'll manifest myself to him. Oh, oh, can't take that away. People always say, hey, you know, that's not talking about some bright light shining around. It's so natural and nice, but you, Jesus. It's about you and me and the Lord. It's talking about us individually out of a manifestation of God, the Lord Jesus, in our lives is so clear and distinct and clear. And we can say to our own heart, God manifested himself to me. And I had so many people who say, well, I'm glad that you believe all those things. Well, I do. I don't have to tell you about them. Do you believe in God? Oh, yeah. I do. I do. I made myself righteous for him and ran that way for him and uh, lost my friends for him. That's okay. I love him. But all of a sudden, he manifests himself to you. He loves you too. And not just that love where I love everybody. No, no. No, no, no. No, it's special. Now, it's, that's a vision for you. If you keep his commandments, if things happen. Okay? Well, that's, that's the price you pay for that. That's what you pay. He manifests himself to you. I've told people that you want your healing, you want your mind healing. Don't stop bugging him. Get in his face and stay there until it comes. 
Now, the danger that you and I run, and we run here, we want, uh, I say this one? the danger we run is we want the manifestation without obedience. But we want, that's what everybody wants. So many people did. But I'm going to say it at the risk of being, or maybe being dangerous. If you keep wanting manifestations without being obedient, you'll get the manifestation all right, because I've seen it. You don't want that. I'm going to leave that right there. If he has ears to hear, hear. That's right. Sometimes it be kind of rough. You shouldn't do it. Now, finally, here's the last one. Number seven. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If any man loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and will come, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. We'll make our home with him. What's he saying? If we'll love him, turn our lives over to him, be totally absorbed in pursuing him and what he wants, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit will all come and take their abode in you, your spirit we fool, and you'll become a knowledgeable, experiential, aware of the residents of God's triune. They'll be in you. You'll be aware of it. Now, I don't want to turn you into a bunch of mystics and weirdos, and I really don't think there's much danger of that for everybody to listen to me. But if you read the life of Senelon and Madame Gion, and uh, there's so many. Dr. Tozer, Kenneth Hagen, uh, if you can call them mystics if you want to. They're very spiritual people. Now, I didn't know all these people, although we actually believe the same things and listen to them. Tozer wrote a, a number of books that was, was called The Pursuit of God, one of them, Pursuit of God. There have been many. And when you hear Dr. Tozer minister, he was preaching out of something. He was in something, he was preaching out of it. Many were. And if you listen to him or how we've ministered, you'd like to know where he, where does he live at? I'd like to go there. Now, Dr. Tozer paid a price for that spiritualism. And everybody does. One of the prices he paid was popularity. As soon as you and the Holy Spirit get together, they don't want anything to do with you. Tozer spent a lot of hours alone with God. Howard Carter. There were, there were many, many people. If you read his book of poems, Tozer's book of poems. Now, another modern mystic, Sadhu Sathmi Singh, was an Indian Christian, taught him a great deal, taught him his family. His life in that area, but he was more than compensated with what God revealed to him. You're going to give up something to have the Lord reveal himself to you. The Anglican Church in his recorded for a while, they invited him to come to England to speak to the bishops. He wanted him to give him his, his fare. And he said, if I'm going to go, I'll get there. The fare will come. Don't worry about it. And I don't think anybody knew how he got there. But he came to the door of the abbey there, the bishop's home. Then, then invited him. And came to where he's supposed to come, if he came. And he knocked on the door. And the bishop's little daughter came and answered the door. And she took one look at the sadhu and she said there and slammed the door in his face and ran back in the house and said to Mama, Jesus is at the door, Mama. <laughs> Jesus is at the door. There are people who have written so many books and writings. And they heard the sadhu when he was in New York and England and said he was talking. He would simply be talking to Smith Wilkesworth too. And he'd be talking about Jesus in his life. My friend Jesus, he would say, and strong men would burst into tears, power of God, repentance, and love, and so on. Strong. The Sadhu went up in Tibet, and it's his missionary to Tibet. There are many stories about 1929 to 30, but 1929 he went and didn't return. But he came back eventually with wonderful stories told in a very simple way. 
It was up in Tibet, and the Lamas resented him, of course. And the chief Lama and the court of Lamas are so demonized, they consigned him to capital punishment to kill him then. In Tibet, they was put down in a pit. And the top on the pit was one key, which the chief Lama kept on his belt. So they escorted him over to the pit, and up to capital punishment, they flung him down the pit, and where he fell down and the rotting nasty bones of previous victims. And he heard this. Click, click, key turned. And finally, turned on his life story. And this is destiny. It was that pit. He looked up in that darkness and he heard them going away. Something to think about it. And he settled down to die and he suddenly heard a... The lid on the pit opened up. And he looked up and saw a light. That's it. And somebody lowered a rope down to him. He wrapped it around himself and tied himself up and they pulled him up out of there. And when he undid the rope, he turned around to thank whoever did it. There was nobody there. Now, it seems like this has been repeated all over the world. He walked back to the city and went to the chief lama and his key was there. And here was a sadhu right there in two and he implored him to leave Lhasa, get out of here. Leave Tibet and get out. He knew that he'd been supernaturally delivered, saved that day. In his official biography by C.F. Andrews says this, Andrew tells the story of the sadhu being entertained in the beautiful home of a wealthy Indian <coughs> who had a great rolling lawns from his mansion. Just, you know, just a mess, truly. One night the wealthy man had gone to bed, remembered, that there's a warning out of a man-eating tiger loose in the area, so, my God, this sadhu has a custom of getting up in the middle of the night and walking, praying and meditating, walking and talking to Jesus out there. He jumped out of bed and he raced out, out there to the great picture window. He looked out over the rolling lawns, and sure enough, there he was. Sadhu was strolling in meditation on the lawn. And just as he watched him, a tiger came out of, came out of the bushes, and moved on him, slowly creeping, crawling towards the sadhu. He knew if he screamed, he'd precipitate that even faster, so he just watched it frozen and to watch what happened. Stuck, the sadhu watched the tiger as he came. The taker came up to him. The sadhu reached over and patted him. Yep, the tiger wandered back in the bushes. And the sadhu continued his meditation. And he talked to him. Visiting with Jesus, <laughs> they being together. There are many stories like that from so many. If you don't read, read them. <laughs> and there's so many people say, oh, "I'd love to have that." That's just not me. I'd love to have it though. You can have it. I'll tell you that straight up. It's yours if you want to pay the price of it. Pay the price of that sad we did, and many others. Now, there's a. There's many to sing, many, many to talk about, many saints he talked about, many stories, walk with Jesus. But you got to hear the other part of it, what they had to do to get there, what they gave up to have more of Jesus. And it's okay. If you got him, you got everything. I'm just telling a little bit about the future. Those of you who give up houses, families, sisters, brothers, mothers, wives, husbands, sons in this life you'll get them back in the next he said don't you worry about it and he's not talking about you know give up billy and you'll get johnny and the next one johnny will be just as good as billy no no <laughs> you'll get billy trust jesus and do what he wants done he'll take care of the rest and satan will always dangle something over you don't trust jesus because he didn't do this i just can't wait I'm tired of this joke no you want that part Go through that tired junk stuff. Find Jesus on the other side. This is Mike. I pray this has helped you. Jesus is Lord. I'll see you next time.